Welcome back to another episode of High Side, Low Side. I am your host, Spurgeon. My co-host right here is Zach, and we are flying through season four. I feel like we're already like two episodes in. This is great. It's almost as ep- as if we've done one episode, and now we're doing the second episode. <laughs> Remarkable. Um, so the topic today, everybody, um, in case you're not aware is motorcycle passengers, passenger accommodations, motorcycles that are good for passengers, motorcycles that are bad for passengers, passenger attitudes. And we, we, we started uh, kicking this idea around the other day, and we all of a sudden we were flying off the handle, and the, the producer was like, whoa, 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 save it for them. We had more <laughs> to talk about than pass- about passengers than I thought we would. And, and I, I mean, when, I, yeah. when we first started, like, maybe we should do an episode on this, I was like, ah, I don't know if there's me enough. And then all of a sudden it was like, whoa, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to other right. people joining you on a motorcycle. And we're going to talk about, we got some Indeed. new stuff that we wanted to, that we hit on. Um, it should be mentioned that it is only Zach and I today. There is no extra host. So True. if you're waiting for somebody else to come and, you know, actually impress you, uh, they're not coming <laughs> and you're just stuck with the two of us. Indeed. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess in the end of the day, you will be the judge of whether or not we have enough to talk about to do with passengers and whether or not this is a good podcast. Um, but before we get in to the meat of what we talk about, we need to um, talk about our lovely sponsor, Motul, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for those of you that live on the Northeast or in the Midwest, like I do, um, you've noticed that it's like bug time, like bugs are back in a big way here. Mm. So. And so for those of you listening in coastal California near where I live, sometimes in other parts of the country, when you ride, there are bugs flying around in the air. I know it sounds crazy. And then they hit your face shield and they splatter or they hit your bike and they splatter. And it's really annoying. And yeah. we don't have that problem here. We, we, we pay for our cost of living in other ways, but bugs. Are <laughs> yeah. So my dad came home from, I should, I actually, I had it on my phone and I should have saved it. I'll have to have, see if, uh, if the editors can put it up on the screen, but my dad came home from a ride and he looked like he rode, it was like a bug graveyard all over his bike and his helmet. Um, <laughs> and he looked like, Ugh. like one of those like bug zappers at like a camp store. Uh, but anyway, the point is, if you're, the point looking is. For, <laughs> if you're looking for an easy way to remove bugs, you should check out Motul's insect remover it's a little spray bottle you spray it on your bike and it uh it takes the bugs away basically it it uh i believe they they claim that it literally melts the bugs away which (laughs) is a is a little bit more i mean so it freaks me out a little bit to think about it melting bug bodies but evidently they've come up with a system whereby you can uh you get rid of the bugs you don't you don't uh harsh the finish on your your face shield or your motorcycle or whatever um and it does come in a very convenient little bottle that you can take with you which is nice it was funny. So I remember reading that and it was like, it melts the bugs. And I'm like, it's kind of like, if you ever remember the infomercial uh, for like that the, the cold touch soldering iron. And I remember a buddy at the time was like, how does that, how do they do it? It's cold to the touch and it still melts the solder. It's like alien technology. And I feel like this is probably something along those lines. Like, I don't want to know exactly how it works. Okay. 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 So before Spurgeon goes on an alien tangent and starts talking about abductions and Roswell. And all that jazz. <laughs> Should probably move um. on with today's podcast. And we can go ahead and kick things off with a t shirt winner, perhaps. Maybe a t shirt. Uh, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's give away a t shirt. Everybody loves a free t shirt. Uh, you, you you should take this one. I think I took the last well, one. I? Well, I think we're giving away two T-shirts today. So that's the big. Uh, oh, that's right. The big shift in today is I, I'm I as I mentioned in the previous episode, I want to work to be able to have you know young Zachary here give away T-shirts <laughs> as well. And I believe you were actually the one that picked the winner. Uh, Aro Mano one. Aromano one? Yeah, Ar- okay. Aromano one. You're right. You're right about this. I'm remembering. I remember the meeting now. I promise. The meeting was yesterday, Aromano- folks. So for those of you listening, the, the meeting <laughs> that Zach is trying to remember happened yesterday. I, I go to a lot of meetings. I don't know how to talk about it. <laughs> Aromano one, if you are listening, you are the winner of our first t-shirt giveaway for this episode. Um, Aromano one wrote in and said, uh, basically... Uh, that she is a new female writer. She's a little bit lost and she had a great time listening to our podcast because she feels like there's good information, um, like hanging out with friends. Um, And so we always love a a flattering comment, of course. We normally try to pick ones that make fun of us because we have a little (laughs) bit more fun with that. But uh, we were so excited to get a compliment from a female listener that we couldn't help but give a t-shirt away. So Armano one please send an email to highsidelowside at revzilla.com and claim your t-shirt and i i do believe that it's unisex so i can't imagine it'll fit you particularly well but anyway (laughs) it's a free t-shirt and we thank you so much for listening 
So uh, I, we should probably, before I announce winner two, we should probably say that if you're listening to the first time, the way that you win a t-shirt is you leave us an Apple iTunes review. It is the number one way that we get like, you know, kudos in the world of podcasting on the podcasting charts and such. Um, so all of these reviews were picked from people that went and, you know, left us an Apple iTunes review. So thank you to everyone out there that's been doing it. The reviews have been great. Zach and I do read them all. And to prove it, winner two... <laughs> is Yuri a Turksera? Turks Tex Terex Terexeria? Terexeria maybe? Terexeria? Either way, Yuri. Uh, <laughs> Yuri A. <laughs> <laughs> so Yuri wrote in, and this was actually a response to uh, in the Ryan Fortnite episode. So the season finale of season three, we had Ryan Fortnite on, and I talked about the fact that I stole this husky mug um, to. Uh, from this this campsite that I was at, and or this this ta- this cabin that we I am yeah yeah. But he he or she Yuri wrote it and said Spurge, I would very much like my husky mug back. You took it from my cabin. <laughs> I am I am however uh, a, a person willing to forgive and forget, and I'll accept a T-shirt in its place. So. I couldn't give the mug back if I wanted to because I actually stole the mug to give it to a friend. Um, my uh, uh. my buddy Mike Glazer. Uh, was at the time riding a Husky Terra 650 and the bike was so god awfully bad that like I stole the mug to give him as like a cheap consolation prize for the fact that he had this <laughs> crappy crappy bike. I would like to say that I liked the Husky 650 Terra. I remember thinking it was I know a lot some time has passed since that bike came and went, but I remember liking it. I remember like uh, rocking around the 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 city. I thought it was like a pretty good commuter bike. It was tall, had good torque. It was fun to ride. You're the only. You're the only one. Am I? Yeah. So I thought it. What, what, what so was wrong with it? Here's here's how I know that the Terra 650 is not a good bike. So I had done a rally up in Canada with my buddy with a with a bunch of our friends, but my buddy Jeff got uh kind of suckered into riding the Terra 650. Mike was off living in China for a couple of years. We had gone up to Canada, and Mike had left his his bike behind when he moved to China, and we needed a bike for Jeff and Jeff went up and I was on the 1090 and Jeff was on this, this Terra 650 and by all intents and purposes, Mike or uh, uh, Jeff rather should have been able to crush me because I was on this big 500 pound bike and he was on this little Terra 650 and like I smoked him. He just like the bike was, the bike is just unrideable. So I, well, we, I stand behind oh my, my statement. Unrideable. Get out. Of, okay. If you, if you're out there and you're listening and you're one of the four other people that owns a Terra 650 <laughs> or a 650 Terra, um, I think you should hold your head high. I think you made a fine purchase. The worst you can say about that bike is that it's ugly. But this is going to turn into like another. Is, tur- uh, <laughs> this is going to turn into another turbo conversation. Where like I just get ambassador. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the point it, is yeah. um, this person wrote in a very um, funny review on Apple iTunes, and we appreciated it. And we're sending a T-shirt, even though we have no proof whatsoever that it was actually your husky mug that Spension, uh, Spension, Spurgeon, Spurgeon. Uh, stole and gave away. You have to, uh, yeah, just so everyone's clear, in order to claim the t-shirt, and this goes for past winners as well, uh, in order to claim the t-shirt, you have to send us an email to highsidelowside.revzilla.com with your information, and we will send you a free t-shirt. So now we can move on to the news. That's like right. We there, talked I about kinda... the news last time with our new <laughs> our new colleague, Jen Dunstan. We talked about uh, all the stuff that happened in the interim between seasons three and four. And um, we had a good time chewing that stuff over. Um, and it feels like something that's worth doing on the reg if we can come up with enough uh, worthy topics. So um, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Spurge, but... Um, the the first item on the list is this lane splitting bill in Oregon, which is sort of putting the cart before the horse a little bit. But we did want to mention um, that there is a lane splitting bill that I believe is going to the governor's desk to be signed. And um, even though it has not made it to law, it is basically uh, further than any legislation you know, uh, uh, has made it for, for lane splitting, which is exciting. And it's interesting because, you know, there's a couple of states out there that have been dabbling in this for a while. Really, yep. the only state other, I think Utah has got some laws in the books at this point, but really California is the, the big state that comes to mind about where yep. you're allowed to lane split versus like all of the European countries where, you know, it's pretty much allowed. And I think this always sparks an interesting debate with people that, feel like lane spitting is great and then there's the other side of the fence where people are like you should never be able to do that and we have a lot we've had a lot of articles on common tread and we have a really uh hard core audience that like types in and comments on the common tread articles and like 
there's always one or two people that feel like lane splitting is incredibly dangerous. And like, I don't understand those people. Like, I think that lane splitting, if done correctly, <laughs> is actually something that all motorcyclists should want to be able to have as a privilege. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think, unfortunately, the if done correctly is the is the whole point of sure. it, right? Like, yeah. Um, it's okay to eat sugar in moderation. <laughs> it's okay to do lots of things as long as you do it correctly. And that's the, I think that's the thing where it gets subjective and people don't, you know, they can't agree on uh, what's safe and what isn't. Um, but I agree. I'm an advocate. I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I like the, the benefit, even if it's only perceived at first that, um, riding a two wheeled vehicle or single track mobility can be more efficient to get across urban areas, stuff like that. I think that, um, I think it has potential to be a, a boon, you know, be a good thing for motorcycling. Do you um, remember, so do you I remember, hope, do you remember your first time in Southern, do you remember your first time doing it? Like, do you remember like moving to Southern California, your first experience? Like lane splitting? My first time doing it. That's a... Lane splitting. Lane, lane splitting. That's a very forward you, question. You pervert. Yeah, I said I, lane splitting. <laughs> um, I don't... I don't... The No. The 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 first time... like I'm sure it was riding in California. Yeah. Um, I remember I did a trip with my dad when I was in my teens maybe or something. And we like rented a bike and we borrowed a bike from someone else. And we... Um, but no, I don't have a specific memory of it, but, but I do know that, um, like with my daily rider videos, for example, a lot of people comment on it. My dad, my dad lives in Vermont still. And he often says, you know, I, I watched that daily rider video you did. And, and, and I say like, what, how do you feel about my opinions about the bike? And he'll say, I don't know. All I was focused on was how you go to the front of the line. Every time you go to a stoplight, it blows my mind. I, like that's, you just, you, the way you ride is so different than the way that I experience traffic, for example, in um, you know, where he rides, not that there's any traffic in Vermont. I'm just glad to see that your is, dad's actually watching your videos. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's <laughs> no, one, he, that's one person out there. That was years ago. <laughs> the point is, I think that, um, this, this thing in Oregon is, is worth watching if you're interested in motorcycles. Um, because I think how people react to it and how far it makes it is, um, uh, I don't know, indicative of how much acceptance our, our pastime has. All right. So, so let's move on the, the next piece of news. And this is actually something that we, we touched on loosely last time. It's been a, a, a hot button topic, but, um, as of, the recording of this podcast right now, you have actually ridden side by side a Harley Davidson Pan America and a BMW R twelve fifty GS. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. What? What? Which ones? Which one's the better bike? Which one did you like better? <laughs> like, give me because like I rode the Pan America, but right. I rode the GS like two years ago. So like you actually had a side by side comparison. Which one was your take home? Um, the short answer is the BMW is better. Uh, but not in maybe not in the ways that you would expect, you know, um, I would have assumed that Harley would have made a lot more mistakes making their first large adventure bike, uh, first adventure bike, um, than than it did. I mean, I, I, a lot of the stuff is really right on the money. Like it handles well, it's got good turning radius. It, it, all the stuff that you said in your first ride article on common tread Spurge, you know, they, they sort of, um, that the basics of it are quite good. The big, the, the differentiator, frankly, um, it was refinement. Um, mm. They don't, uh, there's there's little stuff that they didn't quite figure out. You know, you pointed out the reg rack being mounted at the bottom of the bike, which is arguably something. Um, the When you turn, when we, the bike we had, when we turn the handlebars all the way to the right, uh, the handlebar hits the windshield adjuster um, at full lock, which is kind of a weird mistake to make. Yeah. Um, the buttons that the cruise control and the blinker cancel are strange. They, there's no tactile feel whatsoever. Like you push on the, and it's sort of like pushing on a sponge. There's no like click to know that you've engaged the button or done anything. It's kind of spongy and weird. Um, and then like the, the, the dash, the dash, it has this enormous TFT dash. And then the font is absolutely minuscule. So you have these like little, like you take and there's the so much, and there's so like, much stuff going on too. It's like, it's like, yeah, there's a lot all over the place. Yeah. Right. But then it's like, you know, your rear tire pressure is and you have to get your face like 18 <laughs> inches from the dash to see what's going on, which is obviously not what you want to be doing when you're supposed to be riding a motorcycle. So that stuff is is is, uh, you know, is a miss on Harley's part. But um, there's just a lot that's and most of it is so good. It's really it, it was uh, it was it was impressive that I'm I'm uh, I'm excited. I hope people buy it. Yeah. I hope that Harley can, you know, breaks into this category in a real way because. It's an impressive machine. I just, I, I mean, my big hope is that they carry it through with other, with other models because the engine is so good. I mean, yeah, with that that yes. engine is is like, and it's a different engine than what you'd expect with Harley Davidson. I was actually talking to this to, to someone the other day. I was asking me a question about it, but it's like right around five thousand RPM, it just wakes up and it turns into a real fire breather. But below five thousand RPM, yeah. it's actually relatively docile and it's you know easy to yep. manage and control. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very European engine. That's how I feel about it. It's, it's like, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a solid V twin, but yeah, not a, like another Harley that you have probably ridden, you know, it like pulls hard all the way to red line, which is almost 10 grand, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, it's a, it's a holy, it's light, it's compact, it's powerful. It's, it's a, holy. It's a modern. It's engine. a holy motorcycle. Are you saying <laughs> this is some kind of a religious experience for you, Zachary? Uh, we, we keep, we keep, uh, <laughs> we keep the church out of high side, low side. Uh, All but right, yeah, well, it's a, it's so a, you will be doing an article, right? So actually, probably by the time this podcast goes live, you will have an article for people to read. All of your harebrained thoughts over on Common Track, correct? <laughs> I can only assume that by the time people are listening to this, I will have finished that assignment. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. So for those of you that are listening, um, Zach sometimes needs a little bit of gentle nudging to get him to finish his, his writing assignments. He's like back <laughs> in like 10th grade English class where it's like young Zachary's not doing his homework on time. So Lance has to Lance has Ouch. to lay into him sometimes. It's it's horrible uh, to watch. Brutal. <laughs> so on the topic of Harley Davidson and not on the topic of my procrastination, thank you very much. Um, it was announced that Harley is matching Triumph in this whole uh, pre-owned program thing right so you're gonna be able to buy used harleys from dealerships as you'll be able to buy used triumphs which was announced a few months ago yeah i think it's an, it's a really interesting program to see you know uh, this move into the world of motorcycling i i don't know exactly how this is going to play out for dealers i mean I, I think for most people listening they might not realize that like the majority of revenue that uh, i can't say this for all dealers like i worked at the dealership level and the majority of revenue yep. that we were pulling in really was on on used motorcycles there were just you know there's more margins available oh, really um yeah a lot of a lot of the margins on new hmm. bikes like i don't think people realize this they walk in they're like i want two thousand dollars off and unless there's a rebate you know a lot of these bikes don't have that kind of margin on a new machine so you know for right. for myself i i saw the biggest margins in the used market now i think that's going to be uh, up for debate in 2021 as we've seen used prices skyrocket um yeah i think it's gonna be a really interesting play but as far as you know walking into a dealership and knowing that there's a a certified pre-owned motorcycle that you know is going to be guaranteed by the manufacturer I, I think is a really interesting and smart play especially with the quality right like motorcycles have gotten so good that i think it allows manufacturers to be able to give this guarantee yeah yeah that's fair so do you think having worked at a dealer are dealers going to be, you said they used to, you know, when you worked there, they made most of the money on used bikes. Do you think that with, uh, won't, won't this require a manufacturer's suggested retail price for used bikes as well? And will that control margins in a way that dealers wouldn't like? Do you think dealers are going to like this or dislike it? I don't think that happens in the world of automotive, does it? Like, I don't think, I don't think with like a certified, <laughs> yeah, like if you walk in and buy like a certified and pre-owned Toyota, I don't think there's anything that says this is what the price has to be. I think it's like, this is the condition, the mileage, the make and model. Okay. And like, we're going to price it like that. So I, I would. So if it's up to the dealers, they might like it then because they can still control the prices, but they get a guarantee from the, from, from the factory, from the manufacturer that it still has a warranty or whatever it is. And that's the way that I'm seeing this program. And to be clear too, like when I say, right. you know, the dealership level, I was on the sales team. So from a sales perspective, you know, if I was selling either a new bike or a used bike, chances where I can make more money selling a, a used model. I think that dealerships make a lot of money with you know service and parts and stuff like that. But I would say that if I were working at the dealership level, this is almost it almost makes it easier to sell the bike because a lot of questions around used machines were, well, what happens if it breaks? And for a lot of machines, right. if it didn't have right, a, right. a leftover warranty, you're out of luck. And I'm sorry, I don't have anything to offer you. Um, there's aftermarket right. warranties and stuff, but I think yeah. I think this is gonna be a great program that dealers should embrace. Okay. Well, that's, that's good perspective. And I'm, um, I guess last question I'll ask you, I don't want to belabor this topic too much, but from a consumer standpoint, do you, you know, would you recommend if someone said, I want a used triumph say right now, would you say, Oh man, I, I go get one at a dealer or would you say, no, just, just it would depend on the person's experience. What, what would you say to a consumer from this standpoint? Couldn't care less. So, um, I mean, you're talking, okay. The, you heard it here first listeners. No, Spurgeon I mean the last, the last used bike that I bought was, uh, was a 99 VFR that had 50,000 miles on it. And the bike ran great. Um, I bought a seventies Honda. Um, like I, I, I bought all these used bikes over my, you know, throughout my, my time, actually my last two, uh, new bikes were actually, I bought demo fleets, you know, that had, you know, right. mileage on them. And I just think motorcycles have gotten so good that I wouldn't ever hesitate to recommend to anyone to just go buy a used bike, whether it's certified pre-owned or not. Um, and, and certainly when it comes to 
any of the major manufacturers. You know, I, I think that you look at people oftentimes equate, you know, the Japanese manufacturers as being more reliable, but I've got almost 80,000 miles on a Triumph Bonneville that has cost me very little to maintain over the years. Um, right. And I've had, you know, when yeah. I sold my Tiger, it was, you know, close to 20, 20, 20, 3,000 miles or something like that. So I just, I think that used bikes have gotten really good, whether they're certified or not certified. I would never hesitate to recommend to anyone to just buy a used motorcycle. You might say that's a whole other podcast. There you go. Okay. So, last so on the topic of, yeah, on the topic of bikes that are not used, that are very new, we would like to address very quickly the 2022 Yamaha YZF R7. So this is a bike <laughs> that... Uh, we were unable to make it to the, the launch of this. So neither Zach or myself at the time of recording this has ridden this motorcycle, but damned if I am not excited about it. So there's very rarely that a sport bike comes out, a fully spared, fared sport bike these days that I'm like, I would want one of those. And like, this is top of my list because my, my, my favorite track bike of the past couple of years has been the Ninja 400 because it's about matching my ability on a racetrack with the about the <laughs> amount of power it puts out. But like, I do think right. that the R7 is a nice step up from that. Better suspension, competent braking, about 70 to 75-ish horsepower. Um, I, I just yep. This is a bike that to me, it hits all the marks and I could easily see myself owning one in the next five years. So I'm excited about it. Yeah. You? I'm excited too. Yeah, I'm excited as well. I... I I think that um, what what I find really interesting about it is that uh, my assumption was that this bike was going to aim squarely at the sort of Aprilia RS 660 model of making a bike that looks really racy um, and sharp, but is actually kind of comfortable. Like the bars are a little higher, um, the it's not as cramped to sit on, um, but. Uh, based on the even just the photos, you can see that it's a much more aggressive seating position, um, and it it sort of looks like it's gonna feel like a true sport bike, um, and I think that's interesting because I think that what Aprilia did was really smart, <laughs> uh, and so I'm I'm curious to see how people react to um, to to that design mantra. To to Yamaha's credit, you know they've sold a crap ton of r6s over the years and r just an r6 is not a good street bike so they might just be like if we make it look cool and make it you know reasonable to use people are going to buy it because it's rad and that's entirely possible and they sold a crap ton of mt07s so like i feel like taking this platform yeah. and, and mixing the two together yep. makes a lot of sense yep. and, there, and i mean there's been kits out for years now to convert mt07s over into you know fully fared bikes so I, i'm excited about it and, yeah. and i think it'll be interesting to see you know once we get some seat time on it and we get a chance to put some articles up on common tread but with that zach i think we can wrap up the news and let's move on to passengers traveling let's companions two up riders let's move on to passengers um the r7 probably going to be terrible for passengers i would not want to be a passenger way. on an r7 or <laughs> any other sport bike for that matter the seats are always like this big i think it's funny so like mentioning back to i'll just go ahead and kick it off with this story it was always funny because we talked earlier about my time at a dealership and people would come in and they would bring their girlfriends along or you know their whoever was sitting on the back and they'd be like looking at a sport bike and the first thing out of like the other person's mouth was like how how comfortable is that seat and like i'm trying to sell a motorcycle but i'm also trying to you know <laughs> maintain my honesty and my integrity i'm like well it's not the best i mean how far are you planning on going and they're like well we're just gonna like we're thinking about like taking a trip and i'm like oh oh god oh, you don't know no, you don't want that like no so yeah i do right. think See, sport bikes are not ideal for passenger accommodations right. You see how the foot pegs are 13 inches from the seat? Oh, well, that's your leg room back there. And it's so funny because you yeah. see you see people all the time. Like especially, I live in Philadelphia, and especially in an urban environment, you see passengers all the time on the back of a sport bike. And I, every time I see it, I'm just like, God, that doesn't look comfortable. Like, right. no. Yeah. And we, so part of what we hope to do today is empower um, uh, those those people who might be passengers to to aim for something better than 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 what they've got if if what they have is very uncomfortable um so i guess uh what i want to start with is your for what when do you when was the first time you were a passenger on a oh, motorcycle yeah. so this is actually a story i wrote about an article for for common tread because this is actually uh it was oh, my first right. time my go. first time ever really experiencing a motorcycle i was 12 years old 
And my uh, my parents at the time, we lived out in the country and um, we had this like long driveway that, you know, came into the property and we like went around the house. And my Uncle Bob had a used like 1980 something KLR. I think it was a KLR 600. I don't even know if it was a KLR 650 at that time. Um, KLR 600, a real thing? Wasn't it? That wasn't it like, like when it first came Whatever. out. Whatever. You just keep telling your story. I'm gonna. Right. Yeah, it. you go. Yeah, you go to the internet and see if that's if that's true. Or I'm talking about my ass, which I do all the time. But anyway, so Uncle Bob comes over and it's like my so my birthday and my dad's birthday and my youngest brother's birthday all fall within the same day. So it's like my birthday, my dad's birthday, my youngest brother's. So we have this big party every year, and it's just like just family. You know, all the family comes over. Well, Uncle Bob shows up on a KLR 650, we'll say, and um he just puts me on the back and he takes off and he rides past the kitchen window where my mother was. And my mother sees me <laughs> on the back of this bike going out. I could hear my mother screaming the entire length of the driveway as he went out the driveway and made a right. Like she was screaming and he didn't take me far. We were only gone for maybe 10 minutes. He just took me down, down the road, rode around a cul-de-sac and like rode back and it changed my life. I was like, this is the most exciting and terrifying thing I've ever done. And like, I, I absolutely want more of this. And then we got back to the house and my mom didn't talk to her youngest brother for probably a couple of months at that point. So yeah. <laughs> what was your gear situation on this ride? Uh, shorts and a t-shirt and a helmet. <laughs> I mean, this is uncle Bob. Like yeah, there's been enough right, articles right, on uncle, uncle Bob. Bob. Like, ev can't be everybody too. has an uncle Bob though, right? Like everybody has that one <laughs> irresponsible sibling right. of our parent that like Uncle Bob was the one that showed up with a slingshot when I turned 10. He showed up with a BB gun when I turned 11. He took me out shooting skeet without telling my parents, like, let me drive his car at like, I think, I think I was like 14 when he let me drive the car, gave me a golf cart that I rode off of a cliff. Like I've done a lot of irresponsible things with Uncle Bob at the helm and I couldn't Uncle be happier Bob. and more well-rounded because of it. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so that was my that was my first story on the back of a motorcycle, and obviously, you know, I still I still ride with Uncle Bob to this day. He actually was the one that just bought Lance Oliver's uh, Versus 650, and he's uh, he's been a big inspiring force in me doing stupid things in my life. So, sounds like it. Sounds like it, that that ride with Uncle Bob but just shaped your life. Yeah. Did you did you did you Google KLR 650 slash KLR 600? Was I making that up? I go. Yeah, I googled KLR 600, and I did not spend very much time researching it. There were a lot of pictures. I think I, when I clicked on the first link, it took me to a disambiguation for um, uh, Wikipedia that had to do with the KLR 650. A dis so it seems a like disambiguation. What uh, what kind of like eleventh grade vocabulary <laughs> words are you using for our podcast? The point is, it seems that most of the people that have searched for KLR 600 have been pointed to KLR 650 content because maybe that's what they were looking for in the first place. Well, for what it's worth, I um, thought that when they, like for the first year- It doesn't year, matter what kind of bike Uncle Bob had, to be honest with everyone. <laughs> the point is, Virgin got on the back and went on a ride with his uncle and his mom freaked out. 1980, 1988, 1986 through 1988 KLR 600 is what I'm saying. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> we're just, we're solving all the world's problems with today's podcast. Zach, <laughs> what, was, uh, what was your first experience on the back of a motorcycle? I don't remember. Um, I don't remember. But you don't remember? I start. No, absolutely not. Was it because you were so because, young? Correct. I started like sitting out. Like I remember, you know, my dad started racing um, when I was two or three or something. Um, so you know, there, there, there's a picture of me um, somewhere um, at the homestead of of his friend pushing his bike back from tech inspection, you know, like when you do, when you do club racing, you go to technical inspection where they make sure your bike is safe and you normally push that up and you show them your helmet and you show them you have a safe helmet. You show them that the bike is um, safe to go on the track, safety wired, all that jazz. I was coming back from tech with him and he put me on the front of the gas tank. So I could, so I was, you know, three years old or something like that. And I could hold onto the handlebars and he was pushing me along. So my first ride on a motorcycle is not something that I remember through my own eyes, uh, more through stories and that kind of thing. But I've, um, I have yeah, spent a lot of time where, I mean, I grew up getting put on the, on the gas tank as a little kid. And then when I was big enough riding on the back, um, and, uh, my mom was nice enough to not ever freak out about it to this day. Um, she's, she's unflappable when it comes to, um, 
my my riding either on the front or back of motorcycles. So I feel like my mom's gotten a lot better with it, and, and that's actually something I'll bring up later. But I guess my question for you is like, do you have like one memory of like being a pastor? Like, do you have, like obviously you don't remember your first one, but do you have like one memory that sticks out that you're like that's what I remember being the beginning. So I have a memory of going on a ride. I, I remember we were gonna we were going somewhere. My dad had to do an errand or something, and he said we could take the bike if you want. Uh, and I lived in uh, rural Vermont, is where I grew up, and so lots of dirt roads. Like we live miles and miles from pavement, um, and the roads in the springtime are um, quite muddy and ruddy sometimes, and it's not great motorcycle uh, weather, especially or roads, especially if you. you know, my dad had street bikes, not not dual sports or dirt bikes or whatever. So. He said, we can take the bike, but it might be a little, it might be a little risky, you know? And I said, well, I want to go on the bike. I, I was so jazzed. I was like, I want to take the bike. I don't want to take the car. Um, which is an attitude that I can represent with even today. Um, and we rode down, we made it like probably less than a mile, <laughs> maybe three quarters of a mile. Uh, and the, it, the road was super sketchy. It was just like the, the, the ruts were really firm but um, a little wet on top and really slippery. And he like lost the front end in a rut and we crashed. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and he, we, we like got, we weren't going very fast, right? We we're going down the, it was the bottom of our driveway essentially. Um, so we're going 15, 20 miles an hour. And he, he like picked me up and he said, you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm okay. And he said, well, you know, I don't know, buddy. I think, I think maybe, I don't think, I think it's too soon. I know you were excited for the ride on the motorcycle, but I think it's too soon to, to do this, um, which is a, uh, you know, frankly, that's an overarching lesson for, for passengering on a motorcycle in general or motorcycling at large, I think, um, which is that the time has to be right at the end of the day. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> to, it's a lesson in parenting as well. Like, you know, after you crash the bike <laughs> with your son on the back, like maybe just call it a day at that point. So all kinds of life. <laughs> I lessons. don't actually remember if we stuck with the motorcycle to do the errand or if we went back to get a car, but, um, I thought, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, I appreciate that he that he gave it what for when I wanted to go on a motorcycle ride, even though it wasn't the best idea. So yeah, now look um, at that, you. That's a, 30, 30, really 30 odd yeah. years later, you're here, you know, <laughs> and, and you've grown up to be a motorcycle podcast host, and your father is. Oh, oh, I can only imagine my family is so proud of high side, low side. So <laughs> moving on, what was the first time you rode with a passenger? Oh, so you man, were riding yeah. and the, and the passengers, you know, so, someone said, I yeah. assume it was a, a lovely, uh, it was, it was my college girlfriend. You know, um, and young lady. I, oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. I was going to make fun of you, but it sounds like you. <laughs> <laughs> that was my college girlfriend. And so I, so just so the audience is clear, I had a different experience than Zach. Zach grew up with motorcycles at a young age. Um, aside from that one, you know, uh, <laughs> life-changing ride with uncle Bob. I, you know, and some, and some mini bikes and go-karts that I had hanging around. I didn't really get on a proper motorcycle until I was in college. And so I didn't have that, you know, confidence of years of growing up, you know, on two wheels. So I remember getting the bike and I brought the bike home and I, it was a Triumph Bonneville. And my girlfriend at the time was like, I want to go for a ride. I was like, well, let me just, let me get my, I, I had, I actually had the, uh, wherewithal to be like, you know what, let me just get comfortable with this for a little while. Um, and I had taken the MSF course, but it was like, still felt pretty big and intimidating and scary. And the first time was maybe like six months after I had my license, I, I finally felt confident. And we were hanging out over at my parents' house. And I was like, you know what, like, let's go for a motorcycle ride. And, you know, we, we had gotten her a helmet. And, you know, she put a jacket and some, some long pants on and some boots. And, you know, when you first start riding, it's like, I, rem I look back now at the pictures of me and it's like, I had like a Wilson leather jacket that I got at the mall and like, that was safe. Um, and I had like <laughs> this like helmet that didn't really fit me right. And like, anyway, we went for a ride and it was terrifying. It was probably terrifying for her. It was definitely terrifying for me because- What was terrifying about it for you? So I didn't know how to teach her to be a good passenger, right? And I think we'll kind of right, get this, right. we'll get a little bit more towards this at the end. But like, I didn't know how to teach her. Like, hey, if we're coming to a stop, don't start using that time to like move around and like readjust yourself, right? So like, I'd right. be coming to a stop sign and she'd go to like, you know, scoot your butt around or like move it. And like, meanwhile, like the whole bike would be going like this. And I'm like, oh my God, this is where we die. Um, and then <laughs> the... You know, the other point was like, you have to wait for the bike to come to a complete stop before getting off. Because I remember we, uh, was that actually, something that needed to be explained to her? No, that was another girl. 
That was actually a different story. That Here was, we go. I, no, that was no, that was Casanova's that was, black no. book. <laughs> that was another story. But um, <laughs> but like I think just just like letting them know that like every movement they make is is magnified. I'm still now I'm laughing about the yeah. Casanova comment. But anyway, yeah. So I think <laughs> I think that for me it was it was the not knowing how to educate someone to do it properly made it a more you know terrifying experience for me. But what about what about you so yep. what like you obviously and like we said like you you had a a, a much longer road of experience before yeah. you know putting somebody on the back right i would assume unless you're um, like out there you know that's like five putting your kindergarten <laughs> partners on the back of your dirt bike <sighs> my kindergarten partners um i i didn't i i'm a little bit ashamed to say that i don't remember the first time i rode someone on the back either um so it's how are we doing a podcast about a good this memory. my god we literally we, you had have, preparation i have plenty to add i promise you guys uh i don't remember the first time that i had a passenger on the back but i do remember like for example being young like being a teenager and being around uh like the, the racing paddock where my, where my dad was racing and i had like you know a dirt bike and someone would be like oh can you give me a ride over there um and and you know i, I was whatever eight ten years old or something like that and and some my dad or some friend of ours gets on the back and is like, yeah, give me a ride to the other side of whatever. And so I, um, you know, I rode the bike with the person on the back and, and yeah, I mean, I can remember probably even, you know, even more so in that situation because I was a little kid on a little bike with a, with a full size person on the back. I can remember being thinking like this changes everything. Like you said, you know, this is, this is not the same experience as riding a motorcycle without a passenger. Um, and we're going to touch on this a few times during this episode, or at least I am. But um, it's not like a car where you drive the car and if the car has you, just you in it or it has one person in it or it has three people in it, it's largely the same experience for you. You know, when you ride a motorcycle with a passenger on it, it is completely different. Um, and that's a, so that was sort of like an early lesson for me. Um, and I think that the, the most specific and or the most kind of acute version of that was I raced sidecars with my dad um, and that that is sort of like um in a lot the, of ways the, the ultimate the ultimate the, point. the ultimate passenger experience yeah it is really be, i mean it, it's it's the passenger experience amplified because um a lot of the lessons that you learn racing a sidecar <laughs> are lessons that you should apply to riding with a passenger on the street or wherever you are um because communication is super key like you you have to you have to the, the the two people have to be in cahoots. The two people have to be on the same wavelength. They they have to understand each other. They have to know the passenger has to understand that there are risks involved. The rider has to understand that the passenger needs to have a certain amount of understanding in order to get on the back of the bike. And uh, yeah, so I think that um, yeah I, that that's a huge that's a huge piece of it that people underestimate. And I was I was fortunate enough to experience that for a number of years racing racing sidecars where like it's it's like. It's the passenger experience dialed up to 11. I'm going to ask you a question. And, you know, based on your previous responses, you're not going to remember the answer. Um, (laughs) But what was the first, like, how did, like, the first time you rode on on a racetrack with a sidecar with your dad? Like, you're talking about Mm -hmm. communication. You're talking about, like, you know, preparedness and and understanding the expectations. How did that conversation go? Like, like, did it, like, how did the conversation go with, like, hey, I want to bring you out to, to race with me as my monkey in a sidecar? And then how right. did you guys practice that? And, like, how did you get up to actually doing it? Yeah. So that's a good question, in so much as that, that, that question very much applies to any passenger situation because we did practice. And I, you know, to, to be clear, I was the one who was like, I want to race, you know, I want to race the sidecar. I want to do that. Uh, and he sort of said, okay, well, I guess, you know, it's, it's, I'm okay with it. And your mom's what okay could, with it. What could so go wrong? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the thing with sidecars is that lots can go wrong. Um, and I don't remember if it was the first year I was racing with him or the second year, but we, there was a particularly nasty accident that we watched that happened right in front of us on the track and no one was hurt, fortunately, but it was a very, very clear, it was good for me. I think it's good for anyone who's riding motorcycles or racing motorcycles in any situation to understand the dangers <laughs> because that's a big piece of it. Um, but, but yeah, to your point, we practiced, we, we, with, with a sidecar, you, um, for people that don't know about sidecar racing, when you turn right, the passenger has to be in a certain position in the, in the sidecar. They don't just sit there. Um, you have to move around quite a bit. Um, these are vintage sidecars, so you you have to move around even more than modern sidecars that you might see racing at Isle of Man or something like that. Um, and so 
I, we practiced, we did figure eights in a parking lot. Um, we, we went around, you know, we turned left and then you turn right and then you turn left and you turn right so that I could practice moving in that direction, moving back the other direction. And he could start to understand what it felt like when I did that. And, and he could understand how quickly I could do it and how quickly I could not do it so that he knows that when he goes from turning left to turning right, he needs to give me a certain amount of time to move and, and balance the, the machine before we go into that corner. Otherwise we're both toast. Yeah. Um, so that's something that you should not feel weird about doing at all. Uh, if you're not comfortable or you're not sure about having a passenger on the back of your bike, go to a parking lot and, and go, go somewhere where there's a, it's a more controlled environment and, and put them on the back and ride around and, and take a turn at five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour and take some turns at 20 miles an hour. Um, and, and feel what it feels like because it's going to be a little bit weird. Um, I think it's not wrong to assume that it'll be much different than you think it's going to be. So I want to, I want to dive in and talk a little bit more about the practicing aspect, but before we do that, let's take a quick pause and we will get in a word from our sponsor, Motul. All right. So we are back. Um, and we were just, we were just before we jumped to the Motul ad there, we were talking about passengers. Um, well, actually with this whole podcast has been about passengers. We we're talking about, uh, practicing <laughs> with passengers. And I want to go back to a second because Zach had made a, a comment about, uh, Casanova and my wily ways with, uh, putting passengers in the back of my motorcycles. Um, but when I, when I moved to California, so I moved to California in 2007 and I didn't have a car. I moved to California and I only had a motorcycle. So going on first dates was really interesting because I would show up on a motorcycle yeah. with a spare helmet and I would usually give them fair warning. I'd be like, Hey, I don't have a car. So that was going to be my question. Did they know? <laughs> yeah. So most of them, most of them knew. Um, and I'd show up and I'd be like, you know, if you're okay with this, otherwise you're going to have to, you know, be chivalrous and come and pick me up. Um, but most of them were okay with like trying it, right? <laughs> most of them were like, yeah, like if you want to come and get me on the motorcycle, like I'll, I'll try that. And no matter how experienced you are with having somebody on the back, if someone's getting onto the back of a motorcycle for the first time, they've practiced zero times being a passenger on the back of a motorcycle. <laughs> so as much as you are practiced with riding with the passenger in the back of the motorcycle, it is important to make sure that you do give instructions and give a little bit of time. Like, like Zach said, start off on some back roads, making sure that they're comfortable before you hop on the highway. And the story that I kind of stopped myself from telling earlier was <laughs> I thought that I was going to be all suave on this, this one first date. And we rode up into like the Malibu canyons and like I had this overlook in mind and like I pulled the bike over to the side of this overlook and I was like slowing the bike down to like come to a stop. <laughs> so we go see the ocean and I, failed to mention because i i naively thought that this was common sense that you have to wait for the bike to come to a complete stop before getting off the motorcycle so like i'm slowing down on this like dirt overlook thing on the side and she just goes to like hop off and when she went to hop off she took the bike and me with her and we were like laying there on the side of the ground with the bike on top of us I think she burned her leg, and that was also the last date that we had together uh, on the motorcycle. So, yeah, I, I think that uh, making sure you're giving clear instructions to the people that are coming on as yes. a passenger for the first time is an important yeah. thing to do. And we will touch on this later, but um, it, 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 we might as well, I can bring it up now because it's a, a salient point. Um, people don't care. Uh, if a passenger, if someone's never been on a motorcycle before, they don't care how twisty the road is. They don't think it's cool that you can lean over. They don't know what a rev limiter is. They don't know what a quick shifter is. They don't. They don't think that speed. They don't think that 60 miles an hour is super impressive compared to 35 or 40. They don't know what. They don't know the difference. It's yeah. all Greek. It's all an alien abduction. So there's no there's, there's no need for any of the antics that might impress your riding friends or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great um, point. Like just it's, you're their first introduction into the world of motorcycling. Like give right. them a good one, be a little bit responsible. Um, don't, don't chuck them off the side or the back. Um, and you know, try try yeah. to try to give them a enjoyable memory. So my, my sort of, uh, what I feel like is a tangential story there is, um, my, I gave a ride to my cousin's husband, a number of years ago and he had never been on a bike before and i don't think that she really would have wanted to I, I don't know how she feels about him riding a motorcycle in general but because my dad and i are, are yeah, experienced riders she was like okay you know i i have i i fully approve the that the passenger ride with with cousin zach so um i we went on a little ride on one of my dad's bikes uh, it was an old moto um slow as dirt 
and uh yeah he got on the back we, we rode around we did a couple of like we did country roads the speed limit the whole time was 40 or 45 miles an hour so we went approximately that speed we just trundled along like never went over 3000 rpm just super super like as ultimately gentle really as as a first ride could be um and when we came back he was like oh my god what a thrill I, that was like, it felt like, how fast are we going? And I was like, I don't know, 40. And he was like, it felt like we were going like a hundred. It was so like the, there was wind yeah. and like the trees were whipping by. And like, I could like, you know, smell the grass in a way that I, you know, I and to me it was really, yeah, this illustrated to me and taught me the lesson that I just uh, said a couple minutes ago, which is that there, there isn't really an amount of, um, of, of slow that you can go that, that I think that people will be super disappointed by. <laughs> I mean, obviously within the bounds of reason, but if you just ride around simply and gently, it's going to be a new experience for them. But think about going back to our first rides, right? Like I remember the first, I remember leaving the motorcycle dealership with the Bonneville and getting on the highway for the first time by myself, like not on an MSF. Course <laughs> that was the, the first time you'd lot. been on a highway on a motorcycle. Yeah. So like, yeah, no, the first not, time you'd ever been on a highway. Not, was your, I mean, your new... I had an 87 Dodge caravan that held a solid 70 miles an hour down the freeway, <laughs> Zach, but this is the no, first I mean, time. On a, on a motorcycle, yes, yeah. So I'm leaving. I'm leaving the dealership, and the only way to get on the dealership is like a two-lane relative highway on 61. And, the, and the, the guy that sold me the bike was like, "Do you want me to like push it out back into the alley and let you practice first? And I was like, "Yes, that's a that's a probably a great idea." But <laughs> you then immediately merge onto the highway, and then you merge onto a freeway. And I remember 55 miles an hour the entire way home, white knuckle, just being like, on one hand, this is the most exciting thing I have ever done in my entire life. And on the other hand, <laughs> I am like pooping myself in fear that like this tractor trailer truck that's like slowly passing me on the left is like way too close to me. And like now you don't think <laughs> anything of it. Now you're like on the freeway and you're just like right. passing and lane splitting and everything on. else. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just think it's an important yeah. thing to remember. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and but I do have a question I, for you. I, unless yeah, you yeah. wanted to add one more thing about that. Nope, nope, please hit me. So I... I I have let you know one of my faux pas with a passenger where I didn't tell them how to exit properly. The bike fell over on top of them. We don't, we no longer speak. Um, and I've, I've done that before with like, you know, the passenger like leans down and like lays their leg against the side pipe and like burns themselves. But like me laying on the side of the mountain with a girl underneath the bike trapped was not my greatest moment for you. Like I need, I need you to remember like what was one of your, faux pas like what did you do wrong once that led a passenger not to want to ride with you anymore there's gotta be one there's gotta be one i can yeah certainly um i don't know i i i well what comes to mind actually it goes back i don't want to like i don't want to make my entire passenger experience about racing vintage sidecars because i feel like that's a, a weird really weird niche to but there's a lesson in here. And I uh, I was probably 12 or something. This was before I raced. Um, but my dad would let me ride the um, the rig, ride, ride the sidecar around the, the paddock. Um, and like, you know, he'd be like, ah, we need more ice for the cooler. Can you go again? I'd be like, oh, I get to ride the... So I'd kickstart the sidecar and I'd, I'd trundle around on it. And, and I knew the vehicle dynamic well, well enough to know that when the sidecar doesn't have anyone in it, it's you can't turn right at more than a couple miles an hour because the sidecar will just flip up and you're in real trouble. So I understood the dynamic of the, of the rig and I, I would ride around safely for the most part. And, um, someone, again, someone, you know, someone was like, Oh, it was, it was a, it was a girl, I think approximately my age. Um, and she was like, Oh, can you give me a ride back to, uh, my, my our pit or whatever, you know? And I was like, Oh, can I ever, and I'm going to show you a wild time. <laughs> So I like started the bike and I like went to take off and literally dumped her out the back of the side. Like she wasn't holding on, like she was holding on like you would if you got in a car or like if you were with someone who was, I don't know, thinking about the safety of the vehicle in general. And instead I was like, I'm going to do a burnout. And I like dumped the clutch and she just went ass over tea kettle out the back of the uh, sidecar. And that was um, very embarrassing. And this, this, and, obvi <laughs> and obviously, uh, you know, not what you should do when someone gets on the back of the bike is try to impress them because I feel like yeah work. this this should have been a this should have been a podcast about like how to not impress people that you're trying <laughs> to impress because yeah. we could we my could dad, nail that one. My dad has a story about a, a friend of his who 
who, you know, got a new bike or something. It was like, ah, it's wicked fast. And then their friend was like, take me for a ride. And everyone was like, okay, and this is whatever, the 70s or something. So he's like, okay, I'll put this pudding ball in my helmet and we can go for a ride. It's going to be great. And the guy got in the back and the dude like went to take off and was like, here we go. And he dumped the clutch and he literally just like dumped the guy off the back of the, like, he just did a, the thing snap wheelied because it had 250 pounds of Eddie on the back or whoever it was. And <laughs> it just snap wheelied and dumped the guy off the back. And then, and that was the end of the ride. He made it 18 inches. Um, oh, so, yeah. so it runs in the family Take with it you. Easy. It does, evidently. Yeah. Well, no, that was that wasn't that was my dad who did that. But whatever. The point is, yeah. So let's move away. Um, let's move away from sidecars. All right. Easy. So like a, a side, <laughs> I've never I've never um, ridden on a, on a racetrack either as a passenger or with a passenger in the back. And this is kind of a loaded question because I already kind of know the answer. But have you ever <laughs> have you ever done a passenger on the back at a racetrack, or have you ever been a passenger, you know, on the back at a racetrack? Yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah. Well, so a couple stories here. One, Ari and I did that video years ago with, um, a Goldwing and a K1600 where we went to Laguna Seca and we, we decided to test the performance of the two motorcycles by riding around with a passenger. So he rode a Goldwing with me on the back around Laguna Seca as fast as he could. And then I rode the K600B with him on the back. Uh, and that was terrifying and that was it that's the story that's the story that i was thinking of so yeah (laughs) okay is it okay i didn't realize yeah that uh is really you know truly horrifying experience to be on a bike that size uh and i mean i say you guys but you guys were cooking too you weren't like just like taking it easy and like having a leisurely ride it was a lap time showdown we're going for (laughs) we're going for best lap time yeah man um but i mean to be fair if there's anyone i would trust to bill into a corner uh, and you know, and stick it, it would be, it would be airy. So I'm not, I wasn't it, the forces, your body is telling you to be afraid. And my brain, I knew I'm like, Airy knows how to go around a track and he knows how to ride with a passenger and he knows the limits of this bike and he knows the tires and he knows the weather and he understands the circumstances. But at the same time, you like, you crest the, the turn one at Laguna and you're bailing towards turn two. And he's like, not on the brakes yet. And your body's like, Nope, this is unnatural. I don't yeah. like it. I don't like it one bit. Um, and yeah, the other story I have about riding on a racetrack with a passenger is uh, my my lovely wife, who our first um, our first sort of real interaction was at a track day, and and uh, she had seen she has her motorcycle license and she rode on the track a little bit, but she was like, I'm not really good at this and I don't really want to do it, and she had seen other people doing two up rides, so she was like, Can can we do a two up thing where we like ride around? So our first photo together is uh, on a Super Duke doing a wheelie. Maybe we can I don't know can we can we do can we put can we put it on the screen? Maybe Maybe we can put it on the screen. Magic. Okay. There it goes. If it's not on the screen, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, um, it's a, it's it's certainly. I think that also, if you if if anyone has the opportunity to do that, it certainly dials up the, um, the the sort of intimacy level of, and I don't mean that in husband wife kind of way. I mean like it it's just like it makes the passenger experience even more visceral, which. Um, I think can be more fun. Well, you 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 taught me because my girlfriend was like, "Are you gonna tell her? Are you gonna tell the story about the time that you took me for ice cream for our second date?" And I was like, "Well, yeah." And you just that now that that doesn't. I'm like, "Well, I took <laughs> went for an ice cream ride." And you're like, "Well, I, we went around the Laguna Seca on the uh, the old Ducati." And, but yeah, I think I think it's a great way. I mean, we've been kind of talking about it, but oftentimes when we're talking about passengers on the back. It is someone that you know we're probably courting, uh, or we're we're trying to uh, we're trying to court. And we want right. to impress with our ability to you know balance right. two wheels upright. But I do think that there's a, a natural transportation aspect of this, right? So one of my favorite stories was I had just graduated college and I had gone up to Bar Harbor, Maine, and one of my oldest and, and, and best friends in the world, Emily Dufton and her boyfriend lived in Bar Harbor for the summer. She had gotten a newspaper job out of college and she was like, you should come up and visit. And I was like, that's a great idea. And I remember going up and at that point I had given a couple of rides to people on the back and we got up there and she just wanted to go everywhere on the motorcycle, which was fun. Like we went, she took the day off from work and we went out and we, we did a Katy National Park. And then we came back and her boyfriend was like, I want to go. And I was like, I wasn't expecting it. It coughed me off guard. I was like, you know, and he was just like, he's like, yeah, take me for a ride. So I took him for a ride and he was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And the best part about that story was I was there for like two or three days. Every day he would make me ride him to work and back. Like he wanted to show up on a motorcycle to work. So I would like ride him to work and like ride him back. And I think that like the, the giving somebody that, that transportation aspect of being a passenger for the first time and like taking them around the small little town for the first time. And, and like you said earlier, you see it in a different light. And if you can be that kind of a, 
uh, guiding experience for somebody, it is exciting. You know, I think it's 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 yeah, interesting sure. to, to to do that. But we often don't think about I, the transportation aspect of just riding someone back and forth as a as a ride. Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me ask you. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so, and, and this is this is one that is just much more general, regardless of who's riding, whether it's a man or a woman riding the motorcycle. Not talking about a racetrack, just riding around town. Are you comfortable as a passenger? Uh, am I comfortable on the back of a bike? Yes. Yeah. And is that? Did you qualify it with who's riding the bike? Man, woman, anybody. Like just like a random person says, "Hey, I'm sure. gonna go somewhere. Do you want to hop on the back of the bike and go for a ride?" Like put yourself well, in the position of all the people that we've yeah. offered rides to over the years. Like if somebody says, "Hey, I'm going to <laughs> this place. Would you hop on the back? Would you do that?" It would depend a lot on the person's demeanor. I, I don't have, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blindly say yes. And, and I think this is, goes back to the whole, the fact that the, the, the rider passenger dynamic on a motorcycle is completely different. And it has a lot to do with, um, the person's, the person's demeanor, as far as like whether or not they're, they're a, a man or a woman or anything, that, that means nothing to me. I would, yeah. we, we, sometimes we have scooters around or small bikes for, um, for, press stuff and my wife rides and I ride on the back. Like I love, we go, we go pick up takeout or something like that. And she rides a scooter and I ride on the back. I freaking love it. Oh, so think, then you, you could know, take she... a picture of yourself and send it to your, <laughs> your, your uh, friend. He might see that as loading the dice a little bit, but, um, the, the, the point is the demeanor of the person it, it, is huge to me. And I think that the demeanor of a person who can successfully ride a motorcycle safely is important. I think we all have friends who are like maybe a little nutty and you know, they might say, Oh, motorcycles are dangerous. And you have this thought in the back of your head where you think, yeah, motorcycles are dangerous for you because yeah. you're impulsive and you don't think clearly all the time. Whereas this other friend of ours is perfectly a very reasonable person, very measured and calm and collected and motorcycles might be a better fit for them because of their demeanor. And the same goes for passengers. You know, like you, I've, I've had people say like, can I get on the back? Ah, like take me for a ride, take me for a ride. And I'm just looking at them and I'm like, Nope. You're not getting on the back because it affects me too. Yeah. It's not like taking him for a ride in a car. This is, this is, we're in this together and I don't trust you. And yeah. you have some amount of control over the vehicle. Uh, so no, thank you. So that's, to answer your question, that would be my uh, interpretation of, of that situation. If someone was like, Hey, you want to jump on the back and we'll just go across town or like, I can give you a ride. It would depend entirely on the person themselves. And if I read them as a person who I thought was safe and measured and good at this, then sure. So I would say, what about couple, you? What, what's, what's yeah. your, so what's your couple, take on that? So a couple scenario? of handful of times over the past, you know, a couple of years, I've had people be like, oh, just hop in the, you know, we'd be out somewhere. So yeah. just hop in the back. And You've go gone on a lot of dates on motorcycles. No, 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 no. This is, this is more of, you know, some of the, some of the people that I would feel confident. You're talking about confidence. Like I, these right. are people that I trust as motorcyclists. They've been riding for a while. And it's like hop on the back. <laughs> right. And for me, being a passenger is terrifying. And I don't know if it's because I'm used to having my hand on the handlebars, I'm used to being in control, but for me, being on the back of a motorcycle is probably the most terrifying experience that I could think of. And, <laughs> I, and I don't know how people do it. I really don't. And like, there is something from a balancing standpoint that for me, on the back of a bike, feels unnatural. And I, I, it could be you riding, and I, and I trust you implicitly, you're a better rider than, than I am, um, but I would be like, it would just be weird being on the back of a bike from like a... Yeah. Do I lean? Do I not lean? Am I following him? Am I not following him? Where do I put my hands? So, I mean, with you, I would just wrap him around you like a big old bear sure. hug. Sure, so. sure. Get one of those big spurge bear hugs. Yeah. Uh, well, just best wishes to the motorcycle that carries both of us is all I have to say. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I can I can understand that. And I think that that's a... Um, that's a probably a unique feeling for people who ride motorcycles, right? Because you're so used to being in control that when you're not, it's weird. Um, so... But I appreciate that question, and I think that that's a, an important thing, and that's probably something that's good for people to ask themselves. You know, how would you feel in that situation? Because you you you're starting to you're starting to pick at the root of what someone else might be feeling, yeah. which I I think is what you're reaching for, which is a really uh, an intelligent thing to intelligent thing to do. So I have a, I have a question for you now. Yeah. Um, that I, I've been waiting to kind of like squeeze into the conversation at some point, there's no good fit for it. So I'm just going to do it. Um, and it's, and I'm interested now because you were talking about how you're so uncomfortable, uh, on the back of bikes. Um, but, uh, this is a, this is a fantasy passenger situation. If you were going to take a ride on any bike with any person, you're the passenger, they are the rider. Who would it be? What would the bike be? What would the situation be? Like, is there a scenario in which you'd be like, oh, that would be fun to do that? I'm the passenger? Correct. 
I mean, <laughs> that doesn't sound fun to me. Like, I, I honestly, like, I, you know how, like, you go to, like, MotoGP and they have, like, the things, you know, or we've done, I've done it at, like, track days already or, like, press rides where they have, like, the bike set up where if you want to go on the ride on the back on a track and, like, oh, you right, have right. this yep. MotoGP experience. Yep. Sure, um, sure. I've often been, like, I would love to do that just to see what it's like from a passenger's yeah. perspective, but I can't. Like, it just, and again, so, I think it's probably because I'm a big guy, too. Like, I'm, I'm not small. <laughs> So, like, the idea of being hang on the back, like, all I can keep thinking of is, like, if I'm the person riding this motorcycle and I've got a 220-pound dude on the back, like, I would be wildly <laughs> uncomfortable. Like, they've got to be uncomfortable. And now we're pitching it in at 120, you know, and I'm just like, I... So, uh, no. so, uh, so a two-up MotoGP bike, Randy Mamola is riding, you're going around, but you're not interested. I, I'm interested, but it's like, I want to look him in the eye and be like, do you want to do this? <laughs> like, do you want this fat son of a... In the back of your motorcycle right now because like i don't think you do and if you don't want this like i don't want to be putting you through that so like yeah i don't are i you, don't think there's mm, no are you ready to dance mamola because <laughs> this is serious man uh, oh man I yeah just, okay, no, there's, well, not, that, there's nothing about that that sounds fun to me no <laughs> that's no. a good that's a good answer um well on the um this is a bit of a shameless plug but on the topic of passengers um and, and intimacy, <laughs> arguably, in a motorcycle sense, that is. Um, Ari and I just did a trip, two up, um, uh, across from, from Nebraska to Aspen on a mini bike uh, to recreate the Dumb and Dumber road trip that um, Harry Dunn and Lloyd Christmas did. Uh, and I saw and the picture. You actually wet yourself for authenticity, right? Like you I actually like no, wet your I pants. I didn't actually. No, nope. It did look. No, that we'll way. get though. Let's get that picture up. If we're putting pictures up here, Bernie, let's get the picture where Zach wet himself <laughs> for the authenticity of the Dumb and Dumber episode. The bike didn't have fenders, and it started snowing and raining, and so my crotch got wet. It turns out that's <laughs> a thing that would have happened to Lloyd when he was riding. <laughs> So we, it was a sort of a MythBuster thing, you know. We 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 wanted to experience it as it would have happened. Um, anyway, uh, that was um, probably maybe not not no not even close to the longest, but one of the longer trips I've ever done with someone on the back, <laughs> and it was on a pull start mini bike um, for 400 miles across the Western United States. So maybe that's the answer to my question, right? Like, I think I would probably like knowing that it only goes up to like 35, 40 miles an hour and that my weight would actually slow it down <laughs> and make it safer. I would probably, I would be okay with like riding on the back of that mini bike with you. That would be you would. my limit. Yeah. Yeah. I'll that's do that. your fantasy passenger trip. I didn't the, say it's my fantasy. I said, I'd probably, <laughs> I'd probably be the most comfortable with it knowing that there was like a top speed of that motorcycle. So um, that is a that is a CTXP episode. Um, for those of you listening to the podcast, uh, I'm trying to figure out the dates in my head of like when this episode releases versus like when that episode comes out. But it's, end of no, June. No, no. It's end, end, of, end, end of end June. of June. Exactly. Yeah. End of June is when that episode comes out. The Dumb and Dumber episode on uh, the Revzilla YouTube channel with uh, Ari as Harry Dunn and me as Lloyd Christmas and our trip across uh, uh, Nebraska through Colorado to Aspen. Um, so yeah, look for that. Um, at the end of June on the on the YouTube channel, I think. Uh, hopefully, you'll get a kick out of it. So we'll I, I have another question for you, and this kind of goes back to, this is kind of like a, an Ari versus Zach question. So for those <laughs> of you listening out there, we have a West Coast producer. His name is Spencer Robert. Um, mm -hmm. He's worked with Zach and Ari for years. And oftentimes, to get photos, he'll ride on the back of one of your motorcycles so that he can snap photos while you're riding. Yes. If I were to pull Bike. Spencer... What do you bike say? to bike, we call that. Bike, we call bike it to bike, bike to bike. Bike yeah, to just, bike. Just a little, little lingo there. If we were doing a bike <laughs> to bike uh, photo shoot with Spencer on the back, who would who would Spencer say he's more comfortable riding on the back of the motorcycle with? Is he more comfortable Ooh. riding with Ari, or is he more comfortable riding on the back with you? Gosh, I don't know. I I based on his uh, rhetoric over the years, my understanding is that he trusts us both to to get the job done and not screw it up. Um, I will say I may have betrayed his trust on more occasions than Ari. I'm not, I'm not certain about this, but, um, but I did one time he was sitting, this is professional rider closed course, everybody. So just this is a closed environment, but he was sitting on the back of, I believe a versus 650 that had a top box, which is actually pretty good for him. So he was sitting, he was sitting backwards on the bike, uh, on the passenger seat, but his feet are dangling 
off the back of the bike because he's facing backwards. And then the top box is sort of like at his stomach. So it's a pretty, pretty good situation for, for a photographer if you can do it in a, in a closed area because he can use the top box to brace himself, but he can also face backwards and he can control the camera. Um, and at some point we were on headsets and at some point I, I either asked him, I think it more like suggested that we were about to do a wheelie and I hope that was okay with him. Um, and he sort of, you know, he didn't say no. So I was like, okay, here we go. Um, and, uh, I did a wheelie on the verses and he said his feet, his toes started dragging on the pavement, <laughs> like moving away from him in the back. And he said, that was when I thought, okay, this is probably like, we've gone too far. This is, it's all fun and games. Yeah. But this is like, this is the edge of the precipice I feel. And we can now back away from that. Um, so I, yeah, I think to answer your question, I like I said, I probably betrayed his trust more than Ari has. But I really wish that I would have planned this out better, so I could have a Jerry Springer moment right now, where I could be like, "Bring Spencer <laughs> onto the show," because I actually Spencer had made a comment to me the one time. He's just like, "Well, Zach tries to terrify the shit out of me um, and thinks it's funny, <laughs> and Ari just rides really responsibly." So I, I think you're probably right. The fact that I think if he had to choose between the two of you from uh, who's scared him the most, you'd probably be the uh, the winner for who's terrified him on a motorcycle. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like it. Um, so all of this is to say we've been we've been you know slinging a lot of bull spit back and forth here over the past however many minutes it's been <laughs> however many hours it's been um but i do want to i do want to wrap things up with this episode by sort of hitting the the touch points that we feel are important to think about and talk about when you're going to ride with a passenger or when you're going to be a passenger so i do want to say and we can kind of uh, start this off with you know zach had just commented about you know putting something in the back for filming purposes we do that a lot at revzilla and i remember we had a street glide for the longest time we used as a filming bike <laughs> putting a yeah. passenger on backwards is a completely <clears throat> unsafe practice and it makes the bike handle even weirder than yes. if you have a passenger on facing the right way don't don't do that unless unless you have a reason to and you're in a place that is that is uh not public yeah and the company insurance <laughs> covers you if something goes horribly wrong exactly. but anyway so this that's our number one piece of advice for uh for riders but yeah so don't put a passenger on backwards um i, right. I think that really good the place one, to start <laughs> the one thing that you know just to drive home with zach what you had said earlier is practice practice in a safe closed course <clears throat> parking lot area first especially if you've never had a passenger on the back before and if it's your first time putting a passenger on the back that's never been on the back before talk them through it uh the, my my real experience was i had got early on lee park's book uh total control it's one of my favorite books if you don't have it it's cheap on amazon you can get one for like seven bucks used but like it's a great book about just riding technique and he actually has like a whole chapter in that book about passenger etiquette and how to educate your passenger and it's really something that like i wish you could just photocopy for like every person you put in the back and be like read this first and then come to me <laughs> in about 15 minutes and we'll throw you in the back right. of the motorcycle because it's a really great resource for teaching people um how to how to be a passenger on a motorcycle yeah absolutely it's a good thing to good thing to look up or at the very least um think about when when you do that and a uh, quick segue from that i think um is i'd like to drive the point home that the passenger is basically never having as much fun as you are. You're the major enthusiast here. Their gear doesn't fit as well. They're not as comfortable. They can't see. They're 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 out of their element a little bit. It's it's not as easy or as fun initially. And and that 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 should be remembered whether you're like taking a friend's friend for a spin around the block or you're taking your significant other who you've been with for years on a multi-day camping trip. Plan Plan to have plan to have a different experience than you normally would by yourself because the experience is different for them and it's important um, for you as the rider to acknowledge that I think yeah I think it, um, even when so, it comes down to communication of like how how often do you stop for a bathroom break how often do you stop for snacks how often do you exactly. stop to stretch your legs like yep. what you're comfortable with is probably not what they're comfortable with and you know that kind of gets into one of the points that I had which is really just communication figure out a game plan for how you want to communicate with them if you've got a bluetooth system in your helmet and they have a bluetooth system in their helmet that's great right because you can just talk to each other um, but if you don't like how are you gonna like how are they telling you when it's time to pull over how are they telling you you know if if they you know are, are having a problem or they can't see or something's wrong like you need to talk about that stuff ahead of time um so just make sure that before you ever put anybody on the back that you have a communication plan especially if it's going to be a longer trip yes indeed yeah uh the uh, bluetooth headsets are such a huge uh, a value add for 
for experiences like this on motorcycles these days. The Bluetooth he headsets are good. Um, they're not wildly expensive, at least in the ecosystem of motorcycling. Um, and it, it will allow uh, a, you to have a different experience. Because it used to be like when my parents went on their honeymoon, you got on the back of the bike at 7 a.m. and you're like riding all day. And you realistically can't talk that much, especially if you're on the freeway or something like that. You know, Sounds like the perfect um, honeymoon. Sh- you can shout at each other. Um, but now you can spend time on a motorcycle with someone and actually spend time with them, um, which uh, is a yeah, is a boon, I think. Um, so just a couple other – I don't want to be too um, – Preachy? Classes in session. Yeah, I don't want to be too preachy. But a, a, a few other little like lightning round things that I'd like to, to drive home, um, which is that uh, riding with a passenger, whether you're the passenger or you are the rider, it's not like being in a car – the passenger does have some semblance of control over the vehicle and that's a good thing to talk about and a good thing to remember and a good thing to um to to keep in mind when you're when you're on the bike um the risk is higher than going on a ride in a sports car you know like riding a motorcycle is is riskier than than being in a car and i feel like if you're uh taking someone on a ride they deserve to know that in my opinion um last thing really quickly um you as the rider should control the machine a little bit differently. I feel like we've touched on that a few times during this podcast, but, um, but don't just ride like you're by yourself, you know, like be be extra smooth, be extra predictable, be extra cautious. Um, because they're not going to be extra thrilled that your clutchless upshift was rad. Um, it's just going to be a jolt to their ride. Um, and I, this doesn't go for new riders only. I mean, I, I've been riding for a long time now and I, I definitely ride differently with someone on the back hundred percent. I'm goes, sure you do too. It goes back to your Bluetooth thing, right? Like if you're coming to an aggressive stop, if you see brake lights up ahead, like give them a heads up. Like if you're on a Bluetooth communicator, like, hey, just we're slowing down quickly. Just brace yourself. Um, any kind of that extra communication. But really the only final point that I want to leave with before we move on to uh, uh, listeners' comments was you got to know yourself. Uh, you've got to know whether or not you're comfortable putting a passenger on the back. And if you're not comfortable putting a passenger on the back, don't feel pressured to. If you are not there yet in your motorcycling game, that's the last thing you want to do is put yourself in a situation where now you're not just responsible for yourself, you're responsible for somebody else and you're not feeling comfortable about it. So, and, and the same goes to what Zach mentioned earlier. If there's somebody that you just don't feel comfortable putting on the back, maybe you've had passengers on the back before, but this person just, they, they don't give you a good feeling. It's okay to say no. And it's a lot safer to do that and walk away than it is to get yourself in a situation where you're not comfortable. Yep. So that's where I'll Absolutely. leave that. I like it. I think that's a great place to end. I hope that this whole discussion uh, has been uh, has been valuable to to some extent. And um, if you're thinking about uh, having a passenger, or if you're if you're not terribly comfortable, hopefully we've added some um, some talking points to to your to your arsenal and either given you confidence or or helped shape um, your experience moving forward. Um, that's a great place to end, Spurge. I like well, it. Well. Ending with the conversation is one thing, but now we have one of my favorite segments in the show where yes. we get into listeners' comments. These are the high side, low side comments that you have left for us on YouTube. You've sent an email into high side, low side at revzilla.com. And sometimes we pull these from uh, Apple iTunes as well. But really, this is for those of you that have either sent us an email or you've left a comment on YouTube. And Zach, I'm going to let you take the first one because I think if we were to stand side by side, you're probably about like just a hair taller than I am. No. I don't think I am. But anyway, the we, point we'll is... Have to, the, it'll be like a test. We'll have to try the next time we're together. Do a side-by-side comparison. No one's no one's quite as tall as Andrew C., who um, wrote in, uh, Hey guys, love listening to the podcast. Um, at six foot four, I knew early on my choices for a beginner motorcycle would be few and far between, but it didn't stop me. Uh, Andrew got a 2013 Honda CB500X, um, which feels large, but um, admits that he still feels like he looks a little goofy on it. Um Andrew wants to know if you guys could chat about what your picks are for a beginner bike for taller riders. It would be awesome and maybe help future tall riders. Um, and uh, yeah, this is great. This is something that uh, Spurgeon and I handle on Instagram from here, uh, or from time to time rather. Uh, I'm about 6'2", and I think Spurgeon is more like 6'3". So I think Spurgeon might be taller. The point is, um, it's a good thing to to, to talk about because we, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, shorter riders, people who, who have trouble touching the ground and like, what's a good bike for them. But, um, people who are well over six feet, it can be a struggle too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is one where, you know, I recently had, and and I'm blanking on his name. I should have looked it up, but I had a, a, an individual reach out to me on Instagram and say, you know, I'm, I really like the look of a Bonneville, you know, the, the new street twin. Um, 
is it okay for me as a new rider to get that bike? And I thought back to my to my own story because my Bonneville was my first street bike and I'm, you know, taller. And it's a bike, especially with the Street Twin now, which is actually lighter than what my original Bonneville was. It makes a little bit less horsepower. It's, in my opinion, a fairly competent entry-level bike. Now, it is bigger than like a Ninja 400, um, but it still is under 60 horsepower. It's relatively lightweight. Um, and if you're a taller rider, you have the longer legs to leverage that kind of weight around. So I think for me, like there are some exceptions where I wouldn't necessarily recommend a Triumph Street Twin as a beginner for somebody that was, you know, four foot 11 and, you know, weighs 90 pounds because it's going to be a big intimidating bike to them. But if you're six foot four, like Andrew C is, and he didn't put his weight in here, but I'm guessing he's probably a, a slightly bigger dude. Like he's probably going <laughs> to, he's probably going to be okay. Like he said, on a, on a CB 500 X or on a, a, a street twin or, or something like that, he's not going to feel as intimidated because he is a larger individual. Absolutely. I think that that's a, that's a good answer. And, uh, I, I, to be very broad about it, um, off-road bikes or even just adventure ish bikes are a good place to look because those bikes are usually a little bit taller, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the engines are, are big and powerful and intimidating. Um, and I would like to circle back and just say, Andrew C CB 500 X was a great choice. Um, that's a, that's a fantastic bike. Yeah. Um, the, and the engine's good, you know, enough power to go touring, but it's not, it's not wild or anything. Um, and I, I assume that you have found it to be quite good for your frame. And, um, I guess the last thing I'll say is I know this isn't easy for everyone, um, because of, you know, where dealers are and that kind of thing. But if you can just swing a leg over one, that's, I I think you would be surprised at the bikes that fit you. You know, if you're tall and you see a, a, a street twin or something and think, oh, that wouldn't work for me. You might be surprised sitting on it. Oh, it actually feels pretty reasonable and I'm not cramped in any way. I want to um, I want to leave Andrew with this. So Andrew had put a comment in here about he still looks a bit goofy. Andrew, <laughs> to this day, every bike that I sit on and I do a review for Common Trader for the video, you, you want to see comments about me looking goofy? Go look up the uh, Indian Chief review and every single comment is like, you look ridiculous. You're way too big for that bike. <laughs> but... You know, it's the same as a, a, a picture of me sitting on a, you know, my personal Bonneville. I, I do look big for it, but like, I love that bike and I'm okay with it. So I just wouldn't worry about what you think you look like on the bike. And I say this to everybody, yeah. just ride the bike that you're comfortable with and don't worry. Yep. We all look ridiculous doing this sometimes. So just right. embrace it. Except, except Ari Henning, who's built like a mannequin and <laughs> every bike, annoyingly. Uh, but yes, that that's a, that's sound advice. And hopefully, hopefully that helps you, Andrew C and uh, any other taller writers so let's move on to jacob b we had andrew c first and now we've got jacob b we're just working our way through the alphabet and jacob says i'm a huge fan of the show also a brand new motorcyclist so you know first of all congratulations on getting into motorcycling it's always really exciting for zach and i to read a lot of the the comments that do come in from new riders um jacob b lives in south florida very heavy traffic every time that jacob goes for a ride um he tries to work on something, right? Controlling himself in a curve, using both brakes, looking for escape routes, etc. cetera. Um, if you guys were brand new riders again, what would you say the number one thing is to work on when you go out for a ride? Zach, I'm gonna let you go first. What's the number one thing uh, you would recommend for a new rider to work on? First of all, I don't know if you're brown nosing or what, Jacob, but this is an excellent mindset to have whenever you're riding a motorcycle. And this goes for anyone, no matter how much experience you have, you should never stop practicing being good at the things that you're talking about. Uh, I still, to this day, I try to, um, as an example, to answer your question, (laughs) um, when I notice a potential threat, I'm, you know, I'm I'm going down a, a surface street or something like that. I see a car pull up to a stop sign and immediately in my head, I think that car could pull out in front of me. So I, I know, I do my best to notice that without having it take up the rest of my brain's bandwidth. I don't want to focus on that car that's sitting at that stop sign and only that car that's sitting at that stop sign because that could lead me to miss something else. So I try to notice that and then immediately check my mirrors, look around and see what else I need to know about the situation in addition to that uh, car. And there basically isn't any way that you can see all of the threats all the time. Um, The best you can do is try. Um, And I think that your, your mindset is great. You're, you're, you have exactly the right attitude, which is to try to be better at 
um, sensing that stuff. That's just one example from my uh, quiver. What about you, Spurge? So I actually just wrote an article for Common Tread about my experience getting into adventure bikes, and it has not been published yet. Um, but one of the lines that got cut out of the article uh, because it just I used too many words was, you know, riding a motorcycle <laughs> is like playing a sport. Everyone out there has probably done some kind of a, of a sport activity at some point in their life where they had to practice at it. Maybe it's an instrument if, if you didn't play sports. Um, but you have to practice. And motorcycling is no different. You have to practice. So the fact that Jacob is already kind of realizing that, I think, is, is especially um, going to – I think it's going to – I just lost my, my word there. But I think Jacob is, good. is setting himself up in – yeah, it's, it's, it's done good, Jacob. But he's setting himself up <laughs> for a long, positive career growth in motorcycling. And to, to Zach's point, he kind of stole mine a little bit. But I was going to say, use your eyeballs. And it's not so much about the parked car, but I remember when I took – California Superbike School for the first time, the whole second day of like lesson two was like different trainings for your eyeballs. And I remember thinking to myself, I just want to go faster. I, well, I don't want to focus on my eyes or anything like that. I just want to go faster. And <laughs> I didn't realize how naive I was because whether it's looking at that car that might pull out or it's looking through a corner and it's, it's really focusing on, you know, wide vision if you're going really fast to kind of slow things down and watch things happen. My advice to you, Jacob, is, is learn how to use your eyeballs, and that will help you when it comes to curves. It'll come when you're talking about using your brakes and, like, braking time. It'll come with escape routes. So, like, I don't think there's enough motorcyclists out there that understand how important your eyes are with everything we do on a motorcycle. And if you have any doubt sign up for a California Superbike school, get to lesson two, and like watch how much better you are at a rider after, as a rider after you've been trained a little bit on this. So that's, that's yeah. my long, short answer for him. I like it. Well, one other thing I'll add that I still do to this day that I think is really fun, and I often um, suggest it for people that are newer to riding, um, is when I approach stop signs or stoplights, anytime I'm slowing down to a stop in, in a moment when the situation is under control and there's nothing else to worry about, um, I often just try to come to a stop without putting my feet down for as long as I can. Um, it's just a weird little exercise that you can do anytime you come to a stop. And it, to, I think it has over the years, especially strengthened my balance and my feel for how, um, how to control the bike. Um, and it's just kind of a fun little thing to do. Uh, and I feel like it's made me sharper. Um, but to answer your question overall, Jacob, I think the, the biggest thing is doing exactly what you're doing, which is thinking about the things that you want to be better at um, and just focusing on one of those things when you go out for a ride at a time. Yeah, I like your balancing one. I do that all the time. And it was funny. So one of the things that I talked about in the article was like, you know, even before you get into one, if, if, if you want, if you're thinking about an adventure bike, but you don't want to make that commitment, practice standing up on your motorcycle, right? Like go, take, take your bike and like go out for a ride and just try to stand up and like shift or come to a stop while you're standing before you have to put your foot down. And you'd be amazed at like it does. It improves your balance so much to learn how to control your motorcycle in a different way than you're currently doing it. So, yeah. Um, so last question uh, is from... Um, Evie from Down Under, which this is, uh, is this two episodes in a row that yeah. we've addressed? This is uh, the second, the second comment from Evie. So this is the, this is the theme for the rest of the season. Like the, every uh, episode will have a question. From Evie from <laughs> the, Down the ferry driver from Australia. Right. Um, uh, this is a quick one. Uh, they just mentioned, uh, that we, we said, uh, I think it was, it was me that in the last episode was talking about electric bikes and said, you know, we don't have enough infrastructure to, we don't have enough electricity to try. Like if everyone had an electric car tomorrow, we wouldn't have enough electricity to fill them all up. Um, and, uh, and AV responded and said, um, that that's crazy. Uh, and the example that they gave, uh, was that they live in Australia and they have a set of solar panels on the roof that will easily produce all, uh, all they need to charge an electric bike. Um, there's also solar and wind and went on to describe, um, their their particular ecosystem and i think <laughs> spurgeon when we we were talked about answering this question spurgeon got a good kick out of what i first blurted out was yeah well no kidding that the infrastructure is okay in australia because you have fewer people in australia than you have in california which was something that we needed to fact check we did i but think it we, turns out, we did fact check i think we were right it was yeah we did yeah. yeah there there's there are millions and millions more people just in the state of california than there are in the continent of Australia, country of Australia. Um, so that has something to do with uh, the infrastructure of everyone getting, and I very much appreciate that, that, this, uh, that this listener can charge an electric bike with solar panels on their roof, but um, it's different when you have hundreds of millions of people in a country, and it's also different when 
sunlight isn't as strong. Australia has large, in large part, very good sunshine. Um, if you live in Manhattan, uh, in New York City, you don't have sunshine, sunshine that is as strong, and you have eight million people that live in a few square miles. So everyone can't put solar panels on the roof of their house and charge their electric bike. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. I do. I'm. This isn't to say that I'm an ultimate pessimist when it comes to alternative energy, and I appreciate their uh, their optimism and their sort of want for this to be better. But it's important to remember that different different different. Uh, scenarios exist around the world for how we can actually do this. Also, the majority of electricity in the United States uh, still comes from burning fossil fuels. Like I think I think coal is still like one of the number one forms of electricity in the US. Um, you know, it's just it's amazing to me that like, yes, electric is clean when it comes out of the socket in your house. Um, but the, the way that that is produced isn't always um, right. the, the, the most uh, economic or not economically but uh, eco-friendly you know even when you look at like when uh I'm gonna, i can get into history for one quick second before we end this but it's like you look at when you know under um the works projects in the 1930s when they built the dams down in the south to create these hydroelectric plants like you displaced people like when you built a dam and you backed it up and, and you you created all this uh electricity that water needed a place to go and it just it changed the landscape it changed the ecosystem so there's always a there's always a downside to it so there's always an upside there's always a downside and it's a matter of finding a balance between the two so we'll keep trying to do our best here uh evie from down under we 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 don't we don't have where we um you know appreciate your comment appreciate your optimism um but we've got a long way to go in this country before we can everyone can put solar panels on the roof and charge the electric bike so Fortunately. Speaking of comments from uh, from Evie from Down Under as well as the rest, uh, Andrew C., Jacob B., thank you all for writing in. Again, this is a reminder that we'd love for you to leave your comments on YouTube. We'd love for you to shoot an email over to highsidelowsiderevzilla.com. If we like what you have to say, we will pull it for one of the episodes. And as always, please make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube, on Apple iTunes, wherever you get your podcast. It means a big deal. And if you do leave us a review on Apple iTunes, whether it's favorable, whether it's got some critique in it, uh, we are sending out free T-shirts. And you can, too, be a winner like, Zach, why don't you announce the winners again? I'll let you pronounce (laughs) those names. Uh, Yeah, thanks, Spurge, for kicking it off to me in that particular (laughs) section. Um, I would just like to add that uh, we know that the Apple iTunes, we've said this before, the Apple iTunes thing, like leave and review, we know it's kind of a headache. We realize it's a little bit of a pain, but it does it does help us with distribution a lot, and we really appreciate it. And to Spurgeon's point, you could be a winner, um, just like Aramano won, and Yuri A. Tertiaria, 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 <clears throat> excuse me. I'm that so sorry great. that I'm mispronouncing your name. I don't, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, and I, and I, I should. Yuri if I was a good citizen of the world, I would. But Yuri and Aramano won. You are winners. So please do send us an email to highsidelowside at rizzilla.com. And all the rest of you, please leave a comment. I think that's it. I think we successfully got through another episode of High Side, Low Side. Thank you all, as always, uh, for hanging out with Zach and I today and enjoying our rambling, rambling <laughs> conversational ways. Um, but well, for right now, I'm going to say adios, amigos, and uh, we'll see you next episode of High Side, Low Side. See everybody.